Fantastic. Who's excited to be in church this morning? Come on, it's a good morning to be in church. Thank you to our choir and orchestra. What a beautiful song. Can we give it up for our choir and orchestra this morning? Love that. Hey, we wanted to make a uh, special mention of the Bowler Jack concert that's happening uh, this Thursday night. It is completely free for you. All you got to do is show up at 6.30 p.m. this Thursday for some good music. And so you need to be here for that, okay? All of your calendars have just been cleared for Thursday evening. There's nothing more important than that, okay? Pastor Brian, make sure you text Pastor Weaver and told him I said that, all right? Perfect. Uh, hey, and one final thing I want to mention, camp scholarships. Man, it's so important. God worked a mighty miracle in all kinds of different things in my life to get me to where I am today. And camp was definitely one of those things that he used. Uh, to Man, God's timing is perfect and his plan is perfect. And I didn't know what God wanted to do in my life at camp. But because I went to camp, I had an experience with God that I will never forget. And it's led me here to where I am now. It's important that we get our students to camp, okay? So if you can help us with that, that would be fantastic. Well, I am very excited uh, to be with you guys this morning uh, to share. And before we get started, I want to do what we call our focus moment. This is what we do with our teenagers every Wednesday night. And I want to make sure all of us are focused on the same page and and get uh, our minds on the same thing. And that is this, Jesus is here. Jesus cares about you. And Jesus, the almighty God, has something that he wants to do in your life today. Okay? Every single person that is in this place is not here by accident. You are here for a reason and a purpose, and I believe that it is to meet with Jesus, okay? I believe that the God of the universe has something that he wants to say to you this morning. He has something he wants to do in your life this morning. So I'm going to do my absolute best not to put you to sleep, and I'm going to I'm going to try my best to help you meet Jesus in this place this morning. So what I'm asking from you is this, is that you would not be a distraction and that you would not be distracted. Come on, somebody, right? If you got a cell phone that's going to be going on off, this is your moment to turn that sucker off and put it under the pew, all right? You don't need it, I promise. There's a Bible on the screen, okay? We love you guys. We're excited. At the end of my time this morning, I'm going to open up these altars, and I'm going to give you, every single person, all of us, an opportunity to respond to Jesus, to respond to what he says in this place today, to receive prayer for needs, and to see a victory in your life and in any kind of situation that you need to see a victory in. I believe that Jesus is going to bring victory victory in this place this morning. Is there anybody that's with me today? Come on. I'm excited for what Jesus is going to do. Can we pray? Jesus, thank you for being here. Thank you for meeting us in this place. God, I ask that you would speak. I ask that your will would be done. I ask, God, that we would meet with you, that nothing else would matter from this moment forward except for what you have to do in this place today. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. It's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Everybody said? Come on. Hey, this morning, uh, we are coming back to our journey as a church through the book of Genesis, okay? Right now on this one, the last time we were in the book of Genesis was last August, right? We stopped in August, so it's a good thing that August is picking it back up, right? Almost like we never stopped. See what happened there. So some of you, because we, we took a pause on Genesis back in August, some of you are getting this for the very first time this morning. Some of you are very excited to get back into the book of Genesis. And some of you are asking yourself, we were going through the book of Genesis? <laughs> okay. Well, we're back. Let's go. So let me do a very quick recap of where we are and what's happened so far. Uh, God created everything. If you didn't know that, God created everything and humans messed it all up. I don't know if you know this, but humans are not the best, okay? God is the best. He created the best and we messed it up. And so now God is redeeming, in our story in Genesis, God is redeeming the world. He's bringing the world back to himself through a man named Abraham and his family after him. And we know because we stay on the other side of history, the other side of the Bible, we know that it's not just Abraham that God used to bring redemption through the world, but it's the man Jesus Christ, right? It's not just the son of man, but the son 
son of God who came down and who brings redemption to the world, who is also from the line of Abraham. And so we've talked about Abraham. We've talked about his son, Isaac. And when we left off, we were just meeting Isaac's son, Abraham's grandson, this boy by the name of Jacob. And if you missed any of these sermons, you can find all of them online on YouTube and Spotify. And so this morning, we're going to pick up Jacob's story. And so you can turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 35. Yeah. Whew. We're going to start right at the beginning, right at verse 1, and then we're going to skip around through the rest of the chapter. So we left off in chapter 27 back in August, and a lot has happened in Jacob's story since we were last with him. I don't have time to get into it all, but you can read it from where we left off in chapter 27 all the way to uh, chapter 35 where we are today. But let me just say this about Jacob's story. It's wild. It's absolute chaos, Okay. The boy's got two wives, right, officially, and then two other people that he had babies with, okay? All right? It's wild. He's got, he's in a 14, he got into a 14-year-long argument with his father-in-law, all right? Some of y'all need to take it easy on your son-in-laws, okay? Sons-in-law. And then he has a wrestling match with God himself, Listen to me, the Bible is not boring. If you think the Bible is boring, that is a testimony of who you are, a boring person, okay? The Bible ain't boring. The Bible's wild. The Bible's the best reality TV you could ever experience, all right? So here we are, Genesis 35, and we pick up the story at a moment where Jacob's life changes for the good. We pick up the story as he surrenders to God and he begins to make his journey back to the land of God's promise, to the life that God created Jacob for, to the life that God called Jacob to. And so Genesis 35, starting in verse one, says this, God said to Jacob, get ready and move to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to your God, excuse me, to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob told everyone in his household, get rid of all your pagan idols, purify yourselves and put on clean clothing. We are now going to Bethel where I will build an altar to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress and he has been with me wherever I have gone. Man, that's a powerful statement. Scholars agree that Jacob, he's walked away from God's will. He's walked away from God's plan for his life. And then after his wrestling match with God that happens in chapter 32, he begins to see, Jacob begins to see just how far him and his family have wandered and strayed from the plan and the purpose of God's life, of God's, uh, excuse me, God's plan and purpose in his life and in their life. And so Jacob's insistence on every person in his household getting rid of the foreign gods and purifying themselves is a spiritual renewal moment that Jacob was going through. He says, I went my own way, but God has never left me. And now I see my faults. I see how far I've gone. I see where, I, I see where I'm at. And so I'm going back to Bethel. And the word Bethel, I, I think, is important for us to understand that the word Bethel means the house of God. I'm going back to the house of God. And then he says, not just me, but my entire family will once again worship the God who answers my prayers when I'm in distress. Church, I don't know about you, but I just got the goosebumps. This morning, you may be where Jacob was. I'm living my own way. I'm doing my own thing, but it isn't working out the way that I hoped. Let me tell you, God is with you, and he answers prayers, and this is your opportunity to return to Bethel. This is your opportunity to return to the house of God. Get rid of the foreign gods that are set up in your life and worship the God who doesn't leave you or forsake you, even though you may have walked away from him. Jacob told his entire household, we are done with the mess. We're going back to God. We're done with the mess. We're going back to security. Parents, we have to have a moment where we get serious about our families and the directions that they're walking. We have to say, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. There is no other option. Let me tell you what this world doesn't need. A bunch of Christians who fill pews on Sundays but are not Christians on Mondays and Tuesdays. 
The world needs a bunch of Christians that will say, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord and no one else. Parents, if we want to see a difference in the world that we live in, we have to lead our families well. Who is your house serving? What God is your house serving? Man, I wouldn't be standing on this platform today if it wasn't for parents that said, this family will be servants of the Lord. There are no other options. But mom, I wanna hang out with my friends on Wednesday night, then you can take your friends to church because you're gonna be in church because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But, mom, but dad, there's something else I wanna do on Sunday morning. Well, you're gonna do it after church because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There are are no other options yeah but it might hurt your kids feelings then hurt their feelings all the way to church and let God repair them at church okay at least for me in my house we will serve the Lord as for me in my house we will serve the Lord one thing that I think is also important is Jacob recognized that there are foreign gods there were foreign gods in the camp and so I want to ask you this morning, do you have foreign gods that have taken the place of God in your life? Is it a relationship? Maybe even with your family. Let me tell you this. We're in a, a moment in culture that says I need to care so much about my family. I can't let my family down. I can't let my family down. And there's so much truth in that. But the biggest way you can let your family down is to let your relationship with Jesus die. You will always let your family down if you put them above your relationship with God. Maybe your family has become a foreign God in your life. Is your foreign God the pursuit of wealth and status? I forsake everything else as long as I can get the promotion at work, as long as I can get more money, as long as I can do whatever it takes to make sure that I'm comfortable. Maybe your comfortability has become a foreign God in your life. Is it a friend that you're unwilling to disappoint because of your reputation so you've compromised your faith for them instead of standing strong on the truth and doing what is right? Because I care so much about what people think of me, I don't ever wanna let them down so I'm afraid to speak the truth of the word. Is that a foreign God in your life? Church, this morning I'm gonna call us all to surrender our foreign gods at this altar here today. As we respond to Jesus in worship and prayer here in just a few minutes, if you have a foreign God, let this be the moment that you put it away. Let this be the moment that you sacrifice that foreign God and you put Jesus back on the throne that he is rightfully deserves to sit on in your life. You may be here this morning wondering why they let this bearded guy start yelling and screaming at you <laughs> because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You don't have a relationship with this God that we're talking about. Well, let me tell you the truth today. I need you to know that he hears your prayers too. It's a powerful statement to say that we are following, we're going to worship the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress and he's been with me wherever I have gone. I need you to understand that God cares about you. He loves you and he hears your prayers and all you have to do is surrender your way of living and accept his because he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And you'll have that very same opportunity there are some of you sitting here today who have been in church who have followed Jesus for a long time, but you need to have a moment of resurrender. Let's come back to Bethel together. Let's come back to God together this morning. All right, back to the story, Genesis 35, down to verse six, it says this, eventually, Jacob and his household arrived at Luz, also called Bethel in Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and named the place El Bethel, El Bethel, maybe, I don't know, which means God of Bethel, because God had appeared to him when he was fleeing from his brother Esau. So Jacob deceived his father. Let me tell you kind of real quick, this happened. We, we, we didn't cover that part of the story. Actually, we did. That's the last time where we left it off in, uh, back in August. Jesus deceived his father and stole the blessing from his, or from his brother Esau, and he ran away because he was afraid of his brother. 
And he originally met God at Bethel, and now he's coming back. And he renames the place El Bethel, or the God of Bethel, because it's, I'm not just returning to the house of the Lord, but I'm returning to the God of the house. Come on. Listen to me, church. It's not enough to just walk through these doors on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. We have to have a relationship with God that is alive. It's about the God of the house, not just the house of God. We have to have a moment like Jacob where we surrender to the God of the house. Continuing the story, Genesis 35 down to verse 9 says this. Now that Jacob had returned from, uh, I'm going to butcher this name, Padan Aram is what we're going with this morning, okay? Now that Jacob had returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again at Bethel. And God blessed him saying, your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. So God renamed him Israel. Then God said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. You will become a great nation, even many nations. Kings will be among your descendants. And I will give you the land that I once gave to Abraham and Isaac. Yes, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. You. And then God went up from the place where he had spoken from Jacob and Jacob has spoken to Jacob and Jacob set up a stone pillar to mark the place where God had spoken to him. And then he poured wine over it as an offering to God and anointed the pillar with olive oil. Come on. Jacob's restoration was now complete. He was back in the land of God's promise. He had offered himself and his sacrifices to the Lord and his family to the Lord. And the Lord has spoken to him and the covenant promises that were there to his father and his grandfather, they've been reaffirmed for Jacob. He's come out of living his own way and returned to the house of God. And now Jacob was starting to be who God had created him to be. He was becoming less and less of Jacob the deceiver and more and more Israel the follower of God. And in that moment, I love this. God reminded Jacob exactly who he was. He is El Shaddai, God Almighty. And there is no thing, no power, no person that can stand in opposition to our God and survive. He is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. He is God all powerful. He is the forgiver of sins, the restorer of souls, the one that brings life to the dead and light to the darkness. Come on, church. You may be here this morning and there is something in your life that currently looks and feels like it is the most powerful thing that you've ever encountered let this be the moment that you encounter El Shaddai God Almighty and let him do a wonderful and mighty work in your life today listen to me cancer cannot stand before our God anxiety cannot stand before our God Depression cannot stand before our God. His word is true. His promises are secure. And I believe that if you are here today and there's something going on in your life that is too powerful to you for you to handle, you will see a victory in it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We believe that he's not only the miracle worker, but he's the life changer. And just as he took Jacob and gave him a new name, which signifies his new beginning, this can be your new beginning. This can be a moment for you where your, perspe your perspective changes about who God is and you step into his plan and his purpose for your life. If only you would choose to meet God this morning, surrender all of yourself, all of your plans, everything to him and begin following him forever. Church, I believe that God's gonna do a mighty work in this place this morning. I just wonder if there's anybody who's willing to go there with me. Continuing the story in verse 16 says this, leaving Bethel, Jacob and his clan, they moved on toward Ephrath. But Rachel went into labor while they were still some distance away. Now, quick reminder, Rachel is the wife that Jacob actually wanted and loved, right? I told you he ended up with two wives through a whole series of things that you need to read in the Bible, right? But Rachel is the one that he loved. Rachel is the one that he wanted. That's why it's important that she's in the story right now. And it says her labor pains were intense. And after a very hard delivery, the midwife finally exclaimed, don't be afraid, you have another son. 
Rachel was about to die, but with her last breath, she named the baby Ben-Onai, which means son of my sorrow. The baby's father, however, called him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a stone monument over Rachel's grave, and it can be seen there to this day. Hold on. So Jacob goes through this whole moment of resurrender and coming back to the Lord. This isn't how it's supposed to go. He's following God now. He's living in obedience. He's following the word of the Lord, and now the love of his life dies. Imagine that immense surge and then drop of emotions. I've met with the God of the universe again. Man, what a beautiful mountaintop experience. He spoke to me at Bethel. I met with the Lord and now the love of my life is dead and I have a newborn son to take care of. It's interesting in the story that this is the only son who is named by his father. This is the only son that Israel names. All of the rest of his sons, all, 12, all 11, all the other 11 were named by their moms. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that it's only after God changed Jacob's name that he has the opportunity to change his son's name. It's only after his perspective has changed and his lifestyle has changed and he's living in obedience to God that he can look at this painful situation and say, you are not the son of my sorrow. You are the son of my right hand, AKA the son to be honored. The sorrow may have been for the night, but joy has broken in the morning. You will not be Ben Oni, you will be Benjamin. I don't know if that's speaking to anybody here today, but you are not the label that somebody else has put on you. When you live in relationship with Jesus, you are a child of God to be honored, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, co-heir with Christ. You may have had a Ben-Oni moment, but I pray that today you will have a Benjamin moment where God changes your identity, where God changes everything for you. Continuing the story, Genesis 35, verse 21 through 22. Then Jacob traveled on and camped beyond Migdal Eder. And while he, while he was living there, Reuben had intercourse with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Jacob soon heard about it. I told you the Bible was wild. So Rachel, the love of his life, is dead. And now Reuben, Jacob's oldest son, has committed a vile and prideful sin against his father and family. And we don't really understand this when we read it because this isn't our culture. See, this act from Reuben is a violation of his father's authority. By having relations with someone his father had had relations and children with in their culture, Reuben is saying, I'm in charge of the family now. I'm the captain now. I will be in charge now. I'm the head of the family now, but that's not God's plan for this family. And later on in Genesis, we will find and we will learn that Reuben's sin comes with consequences. So just imagine this. Jacob's wife is dead. His son has tried to take over the family. And then at the end of the chapter, it says that his father dies. And instead of giving up, Jacob remains faithful to the word of the Lord. Wow. I can't imagine how difficult that would be. I've never been to Israel, but I was told by someone who has been there that the route from Bethel to Ephrath, or from Bethel to Bethlehem, is through a valley. And the Bible tells us that the word Ephrath means fruitful. So let's connect the dots. Jacob comes back to his relationship with God at Bethel and immediately begins to walk through the valley to get to Ephrath, the place of fruitfulness. Spiritually, Jacob meets with God in a figurative mountaintop moment and then is immediately thrust into the valley of despair as he experiences the loss of his wife and the betrayal of his firstborn son. 
But what's different from the last time that he met God at Bethel is that his eyes are no longer on his circumstances. His eyes are focused on the God who answers my prayers while I'm in the middle of distress. His eyes are focused on the God who was with him wherever he had wandered. I may be walking through the valley right now and it's painful. It's not fun. It hurts. This isn't what I wanted to do. This isn't what I expected it to be. But this time, God is walking with me and he has called me to the land called fruitful. So no matter what comes my way, hell or high water, I will keep my eyes on the Lord and I will follow him to where he is leading me. I will follow him to fruitfulness. Church, I need you to understand that you may be in the valley, but God has called you to fruitful. It would have been easy for Jacob to give up in the valley, but that's not where God wanted him to stay. Man, I don't know about you, but there have been so many times that it would have been easier for me to give up while I was in the valley than to continue following God. My wife and I, we struggled through infertility for six years. And to say that it was easy is the biggest lie on the planet. We cried, we prayed, we wondered why, we couldn't understand, we doubted the faithfulness of the Lord, but we kept hope that his promises are true. Through tough moments in marriage, through tough moments in ministry, man, in the year 2020, through the whole COVID pandemic, man, pastors all across the world were giving up hope. In the culture we live in today, it feels like it's so easy to give up hope, but we have to remember, God has not called me to the pain in the valley. He's called me to walk through it to fruitfulness. He's called me to walk through the valley. You may be currently in the valley of despair. You may be there right now. You're suffering through the loss of a loved one, a spouse, a Son, a daughter, you've experienced betrayal from somebody you thought was a close friend. You just got fired at work or you you didn't get the promotion you deserved. Your finances aren't financing and they're not covering the costs of living. You're heartbroken over what someone has said to you or about you. And right now, it might seem easier for you to give up because of the pain that you're experiencing. But church, hear me today. We believe in a good God that is working all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That means if it ain't good yet, God ain't done with it. If it ain't good yet, God ain't done with it. Listen, this is not a gospel of prosperity. This is a gospel of obedience. We believe in the God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever think, ask, or imagine. And so, because I've seen the Lord, I will walk through the valley to the land called fruitfulness. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because I've seen the Lord, I will not fear because I know that he is with me. Come on. Is there anybody who's seen the Lord this morning? Come on. Because I've heard from the Lord, because I met with God, I will be obedient to his word and I will walk through the valley of despair to the land called fruitfulness. I will go where he is leading me and I will not give up even though I'm surrounded by pain, even though I'm experiencing the hurt, even though there's evil surrounding me on every side, I will lift my eyes up to the hill because where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Because I've had an encounter with Jesus, I will trust him with my pain. I will trust him with my doubt. I will trust him with the things that make me anxious and I will follow him through it to all fruitfulness. Would you stand with me in this place this morning? Listen, if there is something going on in your life, I need you to understand that God is not going to abandon you in the pain. He will walk with you through it. God is not gonna abandon you in the unknown. He will walk you to where he has, where he is 
leading you and what he has called you to. If you are here today, I invite you. If there is something in your life that you need to see a victory in, then bring it to the altar. Surrender it to Jesus because I believe we're going to see victory in this place this morning. And don't wait. Bring it now. If you need a miracle, if you need a change in identity, if you need a relationship with Jesus, if you've been going your own way and you need to surrender to God's way, if you are in the valley of despair and you need to see a ray of sunshine to fill you with hope again, don't wait. Come now. Meet Jesus at the altar. Prayer people come. Pastors, elders, deacons come. Let's see a victory through prayer and